Thank you to Curiosity Stream and Nebula for sponsoring this video. Hello, it's me. Soph, and those were Adele's notes. Earworms, not to be confused with earwigs, are songs that get stuck in your head. A direct translation of the German Ohrwurm, they've also been known to be known as sticky music or back in the 1700s, the Piper's Maggot. Different legless creature, same mood. Is that right? Ohrwurm. And they can be triggered by all sorts. A 2012 scientific study got a bunch of data from listeners to BBC Radio 6's Earworm segment, and unsurprisingly, it was found that listening to a song was the thing most likely to get it lodged in your head. But songs were also connected to words, memories, situations, and even well-known personalities, so seeing or thinking of these things could set them off as well. One listener heard This Charming Man by The Smiths every time they saw David Cameron. Grotesque. Was that listener the pig thief? So yeah, we all have personal earworms that burrow into our heads. But our associations of earworms with memories or people could be linked to an important use for them in our brains. What if they actually helped us to solidify the memories that we associate with them? In June 2021, an experiment was done where people were played unfamiliar music. A week later, they were played the same 30 second segment of music alongside an unfamiliar clip from a movie. In the weeks that followed, they were asked what they could remember about the film clip they were played and also also about how often the music they were played popped into their heads. It was found that people who recalled the song more throughout the weeks were more likely to remember details from the movie, even if they hadn't consciously thought of the movie when they thought of the song. The paper's called Spontaneous Mental Replay of Music Improves Memory for Incidentally Associated Event Knowledge, aka thinking of a song makes you remember things. And while we're on the science lingo, it's worth noting that in studies, earworms are called INMI, Involuntary Musical Imagery which makes sense because I've had the music in me. This is all interesting enough, but perhaps not surprising. I feel like a lot of songs have particularly strong memories attached to them. But the researchers behind this study think that music could be used as a way to assist those with memory loss, a non-drug way to help them remember people and events or even to do daily tasks. And it's not only memory consolidation that in me might be important for. Another theory is that earworms rise up in our brains when our environment around us isn't demanding enough attention. And they do that to stop our consciousness from slipping too low, to stimulate us back to vigilance. They're basically there to keep you from falling asleep at the wheel of life. And when I read about that, it made me think about the idea that when we're bored, that's actually a really good time for creative thoughts to like rise up from our subconscious. Um, and I don't know, maybe there's a similar mechanism there. That's just a tangential ponder from me. This stimulatory nature of earworms can also help with focus in more specific ways. I read stories about runners who hear them when they run to help them get through long stretches. And this made me realize that this is exactly what I did when I was 14 and I had to run the 1500 meters in PE class, but I was determined not to walk even though I was extremely unfit. So I jogged to the rhythm of banana phone for 10 minutes and I made it. Ring, 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 banana phone. A more intense example, only slightly though, is when Oliver Sacks, my absolute fave, was on top of a mountain and he got attacked by a bull, obviously, and he hurt himself and he had to make his way down the mountain really steadily even though he was injured. And so he had the song of the Volga boatman in cycling through his head and that helped him get through it. Now, when I listened to it, <laughs> I was all ready to make jokes about hearing that would make me feel terrified, haha. But not gonna lie, by the end, I was inspired. It made me want to go out in the rain to buy milk. It's a very grounding and quite inspiring song, the kind of thing you need to steadily make your way down a mountain. And this makes sense that the song matched the mood slash what you need it for at the time, because there's also been evidence that earworms act as kind of mood modulators. One experiment published in 2015 got people to wear accelerometers on their wrists, these things that monitor movement. And for four days, they were told to tap out the beats of the songs that they had in their head, and also to make a note of their mood. Overall, 
overall mood and tempo of the songs that were in their head saw a link. So whether you feel plagued by them or you're going to use them to help you run a marathon, there's quite a lot to the humble catchy tune. They're so interesting in fact that in 2015 there was a whole earworm symposium. Now while the slide breaking down what a tweet is was a personal highlight for me, my favourite bit was the talk on mind pops. These are things that pop into your head, musical or not. Reminds me a bit of Miel Pops, the French cereal. So that's a, a Miel Pop mind pop. <laughs> anyway, I adore whichever five-year-old randomly thought the word bagel. And I also love the nine-year-old who had Tayo Cruz Dynamite in their head in class. This is the kind of symposium content that I'm here for. <laughs> there was also a talk that briefly covered getting rid of earworms, and so I thought I'd quickly mention that apparently good ways to get songs out of your head are by listening to the song all the way through to get past the segment that's trapped in your head, listening to a Cure song with common faves being Happy Birthday and God Save the Queen, apparently, and chewing gum supposedly, that also works. I think chewing gum works for some like really clever, oh it's like a subconscious that's making your like throat do something else that isn't, so it's like you're not singing a song, I don't know, it's quite clever. Things that seemingly don't work, according to an excerpt in this book, my fave, are jumping up and down, counting to 100, splashing water on your face, talking loudly to yourself. Hi Soph, how are you? Not bad, otherwise I've got earworms. Oh, that's bad, isn't it? Oh no. And plugging your ears. But now that we know that earworms could be pretty valuable, another question arises, much like a mind pop in our heads. Are some people more likely to get these useful, if sometimes frustrating, song snippets than others? Well, a whole special questionnaire has been made just to interrogate people's relationships to earworms called the IMIS, Involuntary Music Imagery Scale. The main things it assesses are how negative people find earworms, how much people move in time to them, the degree to which earworms help the person, and the extent to which they reflect what's going on inside them. The questionnaire also has general questions on the frequency and duration of the earworms, both of the snippet itself and the episode. There's loads of bits and bobs of findings and also seemingly some disagreement. Like I've read in some places that non-musicians are just as likely to get earworms as musicians, but in other places that people with higher musical training are more likely to get them. I don't know. But what it did make me wonder though is do musicians get more complicated earworms? Like, are Jacob Collier's earworms like nine harmonies deep? Is he there like, baby shark, do 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 do? Or is he there like, baby shark? So, yeah, there's some stuff about people's traits and backgrounds almost, but what about their brains? This is what I want to know. In 2015, the IMIS questionnaire was analysed alongside MRI brain scans, and this was the first study of its kind, and it didn't look at that many people. But although the findings should be taken with a pinch of salt or a held horse to accompany them, it's still worth a mention, sorry. It looked at something called cortical thickness, that is to say how thick the folded tissue on the outside of your brain is. Roughly, the thicker this tissue, the more neurons or brain cells there are there. I'm going to chat about three general findings and no stress about remembering the names of the brain areas. Obviously, no. Why would you be stressed? Why would you be stressed about that? <laughs> One area of interest is called the Heschel's gyrus. It's associated with perceiving sound and voluntary musical imagery, aka music that you choose to hear rather than that thrusts itself upon you. This area was found to be thinner in people with more frequent in me or earworms, and no, we're not sure why. Maybe having less brain dedicated to voluntary music gives more chance for involuntary to come to the surface, but I don't know. That's just a little mind pop of a theory from me. What perhaps makes a bit more sense is a second result, that another area called the right inferior frontal gyrus was thicker in people with less INMI, fewer earworms. This brain area is associated with memory of pitch, but it's also an inhibitory area. That means it reduces activity in other places. If it's thicker, that might mean it's better at inhibiting, so it's better at stopping stuff, therefore better at stopping earworms. 
potentially. I quite like that theory. Finally, the study also suggested that the angular gyrus and the anterior cingulate cortex may have a role to play. Now, both these areas activate when you're not concentrating on a task. And so they could have something to do with that connection of earworms to mind wandering and daydreaming that I talked about earlier. Now, whilst, as I say, this is a very early days study and these are very much correlation, not our friend causation. Uh, it does, it is nice to have a little bit of a neuroscientific insight into earworms, you know, always fun to have that. And whilst we're touching on some neuroscience, in more general terms, one theory is that music in general is really good at hacking the reward systems of our brains. So listening to a song is kind of like a cycle of predicting what might happen and then the reward that our brain gets when that prediction comes through and the pattern gets completed. Our brains can't help but predict and music is like a super stimulus prediction playground. So that's something that could add to our helpless human sensitivity to music. And it's these patterns of prediction and expectation that songwriters have learned to hack. Now, there's been a lot of research done into the musicality of earworms, what can be done to make a song super catchy, and it's really interesting, but I'm not a musician, so I made the executive decision to not cover that in this video. However, despite not being a musician, I still decided to write a song, because inspired by the earworm suggestions from our patrons, thanks team, I thought well, if I merge all the earworms together into one song, surely it will be the ultimate catchy banger. Perfect for a sponsor segment. Her name is Sophie, she's a creator. Though the YouTube ads don't really pay her much, so she went to somewhere better. From music to aviation, there's all sorts of thoughtful education on Nebula. You'll fall in love. Ooh. Cause Nebula. free it's got all my youtube videos on plus extended and exclusive ones plus other creators that are clear bon. that's nebula and not only that but we've teamed up with curiosity stream where you can find thousands of documentaries you can sit and watch time fly or learn about the great australian fly where does the future of music lie sign up and see and speaking of signing up hey i can get you a deal that's crazy 14.79 a year that's four cents daily you don't have to look twice it's 26 percent off baby so that's the dollar number and if you sign up they'll pay me <laughs> But you want to sign up? What to do? Do do push the link that you can see in my bio. Oh oh, it's a link specific to me. And that's it. It's just that easy. So easy, it's almost boring. So please don't tease me. Sign up to Nebula and Curiosity Stream to get thousands of documentaries and loads of exclusive and ad-free content for less than $15 for a whole year, including this video about orgasmic meditation that I made that I obviously can't put on YouTube for demonetization reasons, but if you go on Nebula, you can watch it at any time. But why not see me on a Sunday morning? And that is it. Like this video if you like it, share it if you share it, subscribe if you subscribe it, media my socials if you want to do that, uh, and comment with your thoughts about what earworms get in your head. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, have a lovely day, and remember, her name is Sophie, she's a creator. <laughs> And a huge thank you to my wonderful earworm donating patrons with a special science word shout out to Ali Mitchell, hello, and to Sean Peters, hello to you also. And a cooey to Terry, Drove, and Angelo. And welcome as well to you, Anne. I see you there. Three, two, one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Remember, you want people to hear what you're saying. That's the way the humour comes from. It doesn't have to be good, you just have to hear what you're saying. Why mind, wind, wandering? Oh, that's good. Thank <laughs> you.
And while we're on the science lingo, it's worth noting that the lighting in this room keeps changing. Oh, it's hailing. Hailey shark. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, there's lightning, babes. And it's snowing. What's going on? Did you hear that? Hey, thanks for making it to the end. I appreciate you. Here's a video for you. That was awful. Hey, thanks for making it to the end. I really appreciate you. Here's a playlist of some of my favourite videos. Here's a specially selected video that I've selected specially for you. And here's a cheeky little link to my Patreon. Bye bye now.